sí. Okay. Okay, now we are live. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the Topos Colloquium. Today we are very pleased and happy to have uh, Nadarajan Shankar. Uh, Shankar today, uh, Shankar is going to talk to us today about abstraction engineering with the prototype verifica uh, verification system, PVS. And I, I, I had a peek of his demo during his talk. So I'm really excited to have uh, that, that Shankar is going to talk to us about PVS today. Uh, Shankar, when, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Shave. It's uh, really great to have this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, talk to the Topos Institute. I'm really uh, curious to know and learn more about uh, what you're doing out there. And I hope this uh, talk is the first step towards uh, finding out and maybe we can actually uh, work together in the future. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, you know, Valeria is an old friend of mine. So we, we uh, often have uh, dialogues going on for uh, multiple years. So that's also something that I hope to keep going. So today I'll be talking about uh, abstraction engineering with the prototype verification system. Um, it's a, a PVS is a proof assistant uh, based on higher order logic. It uh, was actually publicly released about 30 years ago, and uh, it's been in continuous development for something like 33, 33 years, um, and uh, still uh, undergoing uh, active development. I, I should also mention that if you, uh, uh, anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to either post them and uh, uh, Shah will uh, read it out to me or uh, feel free to interrupt my audio. Okay, so uh, you know what's this thing called abstraction engineering? So you know I uh, view the activity that we as computer scientists do as uh, abstraction engineering. So just like uh, you know mathematics deals with abstractions such as dot, line, plane, graph, function, uh, relation, and so on. Um, uh, you know, computer science also deals with a whole bunch of abstractions, but from the viewpoint of engineering, that is, we're trying to construct abstractions and construct ways of using abstractions and uh, building a science of how to engineer these abstractions. This is, of course, true of any subject. Any subject deals with uh, abstractions. That's the whole point of having a subject. But both mathematics and computer science, they, they kind of deal with pure abstractions so that they're generally applicable to the kinds of uh, precise abstractions that other other fields throw up. So to, to the extent that you can um, abstract away from any specific domain, you're, you're dealing with these pure abstractions. And uh, the point of computing is to actually put these abstractions to work in order to represent and uh, process information. And th this has actually led to a, a pretty dramatic achievement, which is the modern software stack, which uh, I regard as uh, one of humanity's uh, greatest engineering achievements. You know, putting this thing together has, has obviously taken probably uh, you know, millions of man hours. And um, it's, it's led to these layers of abstraction starting from you know, device physics, hardware, firmware, uh, you know, the operating system, the database uh, in the middle, to uh, the applications that you see at the top running on, on middleware. And during this process of constructing this uh, software stack, we've introduced a number of uh, abstractions such as uh, channels, processes, protocols, algorithms, files, IP addresses, and even some things that uh, uh, underlie social networks like avatars and friends and likes and so on. These, these abstractions are uh, what we exploit in, in order to represent information and computational processes, we try to gain efficiency and generality. We try to balance efficiency and generality through the use of these abstractions. And uh, th this is the value added through uh, uh, programming. And th this works amazingly well because you know I'm giving you this talk through many, many layers of uh, abstraction. Uh, we. Uh, Read, we get email from uh, various people. You know, it takes a, a billions of steps through many layers of abstraction to go from the keystrokes that someone has typed to the email ending up, say, in my spam filter. So uh, these uh, abstractions are um, really powerful in, in uh, engineering uh, computational processes. 
the the kinds of um, you know a few classes of abstractions that we deal with in in computing are things like grammars. So often we have concrete uh, representations of uh, information that uh, we, we would like to capture in a machine. And so these concrete representations are how you, for example, print stuff, how you exchange information over uh, wires, uh, store them in files, and you need grammars to be able to parse them and uh, into, into something that's in a machine-friendly form. The machine-friendly form is usually in the form of data structures. Uh, these can be, for example, uh, numbers, arrays, trees, uh, hash maps. So these are, are data structures that uh, we, we use to actually represent the information in the machine. We process this information through algorithms to, uh, to process the data through algorithms to extract information from it. So if we represent a set, for example, the, an algorithm might be something that you use to determine whether an, you, X is an element of the set. So the, these uh, algorithms extract information from data. And um, we use uh, programming notation to actually write these algorithms. Those programming languages are themselves abstractions. They, uh, the machine underlying it is actually implemented through the use of the compiler, the assembler, and so on. So there's a lot of layers of abstraction libraries that uh, are involved in uh, implementing the abstract model that a uh, programming language presents to you. So uh, many services are provided through application programming interfaces. Uh, many uh, distributed system uh, uh, states or uh, agreement of some kind are achieved using protocols. For example, you have protocols for authenticating users. Uh, you have protocols for exchanging keys. So these are all um, abstractions that are implemented by the machine. And you also have uh, abstract state machines that represent certain models of computation. And eventually you have logics to reason about the properties of these uh, computational abstractions. So you, logic is in some ways a universal medium for representing abstractions. And all of the above things could be represented in logic. So all the, all the way from grammars to abstract state machines. And that's really the point of something like PBS is to be that universal abstraction. So uh, PVS uh, has been uh, something we started developing in 1990. There is actually a rich history of this kind of work at SRI already. So uh, uh, the, the work that we did with PVS builds on this stuff. Uh, specifically, we build on uh, the work on SMT solving that was done in the 1970s and 80s by Rob Shostak. Um, there was also parallel work going on uh, at Stanford with uh, Greg Nelson and Derek Opp. Um, so we uh, built on a system called EHDM that also existed uh, prior to PBS. And the, the uh, point of uh, PBS was to really uh, marry an expressive logic with effective proof automation. So what we found was that if you, you could get uh, a good proof automation, but the language is impoverished, it was really hard to write mathematics in it. Uh, and then there were systems that uh, had very... Uh, poor automation, but had quite expressive logics. So the point was really to find a, a good balance between these two. And so in, in uh, the case of PBS, the main uh, choice is that we picked higher order logic as the specification language, and we enriched it with uh, a few nice features to both assist in the expressiveness of uh, what we wanted to model, as well as in achieving a good degree of automation with it. So cr uh, crucial to these are uh, algebraic data types of the kind you find in, in for example, languages like uh, uh, ML or CAMEL. Um, also uh, dependent predicate subtypes. This is a, a crucial feature that I will expand on. So you can have uh, subtypes like uh, even numbers, auto preserving maps, finite sequences, and so on as, as subtypes. Um, and uh, this plays a critical role both in expressiveness and automation. And then we have uh, parametric theories, theory uh, interpretations, ways of actually proving things abstractly and then deriving concrete uh, instances of these. In the end, PBS is really a, a kind of medium in which you uh, engage in a, in a dialogue with an implacable skeptic 
towards the goal of developing really elegant formalizations supported by beautiful proofs. So this is really the critical point out here. You, you want to have these timeless formalizations. You want to do it in a formalism that uh, reflects mathematical vernacular so that it's easy to read, write, and process. And you're working towards uh, these you know, elegant, beautiful abstract proofs that uh, have exactly what you want in them. They uh, uh, get, you know, give you uh, a way of uh, extracting more than just QED out of a proof. You can extract you know, a certain method out of it. You can extract a library that is reusable. So there's a lot more to doing a proof than just getting to QED. So as I mentioned, the thing started around 1990. And at that point, the, the uh, use of uh, theorem proving was quite restricted. There the, the weren't uh, theorem provers that were generally usable. So you, you had to kind of go through graduate school with somebody to, to do this. I myself uh, was one of these people who went through graduate school. I worked with a theorem prover uh, in graduate school uh, called the Boyomo theorem prover. In those days, it was called Thumb. Thumb was actually also developed at SRI. Um, and I uh, used it uh, in my graduate work to uh, formalize a few theorems in meta mathematics, including Gödel's first incompleteness theorem and the Church Rosser theorem. The um, idea with PVS is that we wanted people to just be able to download and use a system that uh, was, was friendly enough and provided uh, the right kind of language expressiveness and automation. So, uh, because we were able to build on some pre-existing infrastructure, we were able to put together a prototype fairly quickly. Um, so the, you know, already in, in like 91 uh, and 92, we were doing some pretty heavy proofs with it. I taught my first uh, course on PBS in 1992 in uh, TU Lungbu, and uh, we officially released it in uh, 1993. And, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through the timeline uh, in, in a little bit, but the main thing is that we've added uh, many, many features to it. And uh, the kind of one of the most recent things is that we have this VS Code interface that I will use for doing some demos. The other new thing is that we have a code generator from PBS to C. It turns out you might think that uh, something like PBS is abstract and something like C is very concrete and that there's a kind of huge abstraction gap between the two. The kind of is, but uh, it's um, uh, nice that in some ways, uh, C actually does support the creation of abstractions that correspond to uh, something that is uh, more mathematical like PBS. And uh, the code you generate is actually quite efficient and uh, practical. So the timeline, uh, I'll elaborate on a little bit. Uh, you know, we started developing PBS around 1990, and we've been uh, developing it internally. We published our first paper on it in 1992. Uh, this one, the Scholem Award in 2021, I believe, and uh, did the public release in 93. We were doing some pretty heavy proofs already in 92, 94 with uh, uh, various fault tolerant algorithms like Byzantine Agreement. These two were developed at SRI in the 1970s. We were doing uh, some pretty heavy uh, hardware verification examples. The ones I mentioned here are kind of textbook examples, but we were doing some more ambitious ones. We integrated uh, binary decision diagrams and symbolic model checking in uh, around 94, 95. Uh, there was a, a kind of flurry of activity in uh, 1995 uh, when the uh, Intel FDIV bug was detected with their floating point divider. And so we looked at uh, those floating point algorithms and uh, did uh, a, a quite good uh, verification of the basic algorithm after it had been corrected. Uh, in 97, Graf and Saidi introduced this thing called predicate abstraction. So by this point, people were using PBS in two ways. One, one group was using it to uh, formalize uh, mathematical and computational concepts. Another group was using it purely for its automation. They were using it essentially as an SMT solver. And so this predicate abstraction was of the latter kind. They were using uh, PBS's automation to build a predicate abstraction engine. Uh, 
So predicate abstraction is a process by which you take something that's an infinite state system and abstract it into a finite state system so that the properties you verify of that finite state system apply to the infinite state system as well. So something like mutual exclusion, even though you have an infinite state mutual exclusion algorithm, you can prove it by abstracting it to a finite state system, model checking it, and then uh, importing the property back to the infinite state. So PVS has a formal semantics. Um, we also in the 90s did a code generated a common list that's still uh, extremely useful. And uh, though many kind of uh, ambitious projects that other people are doing with PVS uh, in the decades that followed, uh, including the development of a huge NASA lib library and air traffic control algorithms, uh, they, these actually involve a great deal of uh, background mathematics. Uh, these are not trivial algorithms. They involve a lot of analysis, trigonometry, uh, and quite a bit of uh, uh, bespoke automation. The uh, NRL separation kernel was also uh, uh, a significant achievement. The, then um, for a group in Germany, in Saarbrücken, used PVS to verify uh, a significant uh, hardware processing. This is the group of uh, Wolfgang Paul. The the key point here is that uh, you know al already by um, the eighties, um, I think it had been established that uh, formalization is essentially a solved problem. That you know it's not a question of whether you can formalize any, any, anything; it's about how. So this is colloquially referred to as uh, uh, Boyer's theorem. So the, the uh, work in the 80s essentially convinced us at least that uh, form, formalization was not an a, a obstacle. It, it was doing it elegantly, doing it abstractly, doing it in, in a way that was um, leading to beautiful proofs. That, that was the, the real challenge. Uh, by the 1990s, especially starting from you know the thing called the computational logic stack. So we knew that uh, significant computational artifacts uh, could be verified, formalized and verified. And uh, so through the 1990s, this was confirmed that uh, you know, we, we could do this uh, in particular with at least two of these systems, ACL2 and with uh, uh, PVS. So later on, uh, uh, systems like Cork and uh, Hall and uh, Isabel also started doing some fairly ambitious uh, examples of uh, a similar uh, quality. Uh, and so th those systems too kind of uh, grew up to do large scale formalizations. Uh, a brief mention about some of these other systems because you may have questions about uh, how PVS compares with them. Now, I really am not an expert well, uh, on many Shankar, of these other sorry. systems. Yep. There's a question. Uh, so you, you mentioned mm -hmm. that the, there was a some work in the 1980s that formalism is not an obstacle. Can, can you what was that reference work again? So uh, the, the, this was basically the group. You know, the, those of us working for Boyer and Moore, we we did a bunch of proofs. Uh, Boyer and Moore themselves included. So the the uh, proofs like the incompleteness theorem, the Chernyshevsky theorem, the proof of a hardware processor, proofs in number theory including mm -hmm. uh, quadratic reciprocity and uh, uh, Wilson's theorem and so on. The, these, uh, th there was a whole bunch of these proofs, uh, a mm -hmm. compiler correctness. Um, so, so the, the uh, um, thinking at the start of the decade was that this would be a uh, formalization would, would be a challenge. And by the end of the, you know, by the middle of the decade, it was uh, not, no longer the interesting thing. It was, uh, I mean, that, that we could take anything, we could take any textbook in mathematics and formalize it. Mm. Uh, an interesting point about this is that, um, you know, proofs in mathematics are gen generally, they, they are uh, difficult to humanly create, but mm -hmm. they're not that challenging to formalize. The, the formalization is uh, usually fairly routine. It's, it's in, in computing that you, you have uh, issues of uh, scale that you have to worry about. Sometimes they show up in mathematics too, but it's mainly in, in computing that you have issues of scale. And so handling those tends to be uh, uh, right. a challenge. 
Right. So if you do look at, for example, the, the incompleteness in the church roster proofs, uh, they, they are uh, extremely elegant proofs. They're uh, actually highly automated. Um, they um, really show the power of uh, using a machine uh, in, in, in doing these proofs. The uh, situation with, with PVS is that uh, what I at least found in, in working at Boyle Moore is that it worked great when you gave it something that was in, indeed a theorem. And uh, you, you had formulated the definitions and the theorem in a, in a very uh, uh, prover friendly way. When it failed, it was actually quite uh, tedious to debug what went wrong. And the failure could be mostly because we, the user had typed in something uh, incorrect. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, what one realizes is that the point of these tools is really to help you uh, diagnose and uh, correct failure. And, right. and so PVS is really optimized for this. It's really optimized for getting to failure, quickly figuring out what went wrong and being able to constructively uh, uh, get some feedback from the theorem prover about doing this. So if you, if you use PVS, it's a, it's a kind of humbling experience constantly to be found out. And um, you know that's something where I spend at least ninety-five percent of my time uh, debugging things. It's uh, get, you know getting to QED is, is just a minor footnote at the end of that intense period of debugging. So so that's really the uh, thing that uh, I think distinguishes PBS is that uh, you you get to the problem uh, uh, location in the proof fairly quickly. Yeah. Thank you, Shankar. The Thank other you. thing. The other thing that uh, is, is no, noteworthy in, in PBS is that the proofs tend to be quite uh, robust. The um, kind of mixture of uh, interaction and automation tends to yield proofs that uh, even when things change, they tend to be repeatable. So uh, quite recently, I was doing a proof of uh, uh, an abstract machine for parsing uh, in a formalism called PEG, parsing expression grammars. And I was changing the formalism quite drastically but the correctness proofs would, would just run without much uh, uh, modification. The, I, you know, I would spend maybe a couple of hours here and there uh, for each revision, but these were major revisions and the proofs were still fairly robust. Okay, so these two things. One is getting to, uh, uh, deep, you know, getting to where the problems are as efficiently as possible and uh, building these elegant, robust, Proofs so that as things change, uh, yeah, your proofs are still. Yeah, thank you, Shankar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the uh, main thing here is, is is the point I've already made is that you you want to uh, be able to exploit certain synergies between what you can put in the language and what the automation can deal with, and when you find these sweet spots. That's that's you know where you really derive a lot of value, and this is true for all kinds of abstractions. You know, there's no virtue to being more or less abstract. There's a, there's a virtue to finding those abstraction sweet spots, where you know you have a, a set of concepts that uh, interoperate elegantly with each other. So so that's the uh, point here is is that you you want to find these uh, sweet spots. Um, one thing is that we did start off with the idea that PVS is a prototype. It's a, it is still a research prototype. We use it for uh, experimenting with uh, ideas involving different ways of formalizing things, different ways of using the language, different language features, different uh, support for automation, uh, the libraries, how to craft these libraries. So there's a lot of experimentation that can be done with a tool like this. So it's still a research prototype. Uh, but we only built it once. Uh, this is uh, the, the first time we built it. Uh, we, we thought we'd be doing iterating quite a bit, but I really don't think we would have the stamina to build it again. It's a, it's a monumental amount of work to build something like this. And uh, so we built it once. We think we got most of it right. And uh, uh, a lot of the work we've done is really just adding layers and layers of functionality to what we already have. So more recently, we've done more, uh, looked at code generation more aggressively, and we have uh, 
uh, been looking at uh, doing Rust and uh, ML as well as uh, code extraction. And this uh, is, is a really useful thing to have, uh, both because being able to execute specifications is actually helpful. You can run, for example, if you have an instruction set architecture or a processor formalized, you need to run it through a lot of test suites to make sure that you have uh, captured the uh, semantics of, of the model accurately. So it's, it's useful to be able to do this, but it's also the case that once you've verified something, it's, it's nice to be able to execute what you verified directly. This saves you the trouble of uh, using some other language or some other formalism in, in order to uh, redo the proofs. And also proving properties of programs in C or ML or something would be a tall order. It's much easier to prove it in uh, something like uh, PBS and then extract code from it. Uh, PBS has extensive libraries. So the, the, uh, the, I mean, these are a small sample of the library from way back. Um, the, the libraries continues to grow. So uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, theorems out there. I'll just uh, step through these. Um, they've been uh, contributed to by a, a number of uh, sources. Um, I'll just step through them. And, and by and large, these are, uh, I mean, these are not major exercises. So, you know, when I ask people what it took to do them, they they probably took maybe, uh, you know, a few hours to a few days to do them. Okay, so let me get to uh, the kind of guts of PBS itself. The, the main feature of PBS is uh, this notion of subtyping. So the idea is that for any type T, and any predicate P over that type T that you can define the subtype of T satisfying P. So you, you can write it this way. There are other ways of writing it. Um, so you, the, this is uh, allows you, for example, to define things like the even numbers, the odd numbers, the prime numbers, the mercent primes, but it extends to higher order functions as well. So you can have, for example, order preserving maps, continuous maps, uh, injective, bijective, all of these can be used as, as subtypes as well. And this is something that uh, already uh, corresponds in a strong way to mathematical vernacular. So you, you do tend to use these predicates as types in, in mathematics normally. But this little thing, it, it seems like a, a really modest extension, but it actually solves nearly every problem in specification. The, the uh, People who use PBS have found all kinds of creative ways of exploiting subtypes. And so this is something that is, is, is really uh, uh, being the workhorse. Uh, and one of the things you can do with it is you can capture the entire specification of, of a function if you wanted. So if you wanted to write the, the that, for example, sorting returns an ordered permutation of its input, you can write that as, as, a, as a predicate subtype. If you want to say that binary search uh, over a sorted array returns uh, the element if it exists, then you can write that as a, as a subtype as well. So this is uh, quite a significant feature. And the way it's implemented in PBS is that proof obligations are generated. So if you want to claim, for example, that two is an even number, it's, you're, you're obligated to prove that two is in fact an even number. And you can also use it to capture closure conditions on uh, operations that, for example, the sum of two even numbers is even, the product of two even numbers is even. And so a lot of reasoning actually takes place through the subtyping uh, information being propagated. So one clear uh, advantage of having this kind of subtyping is you can avoid partial functions. So partial functions are a kind of notorious uh, bugbear for uh, formalization. And uh, People have really strong opinions on how they should do this. But if you actually look at a formalization, it turns out subtyping is the best way to do it. It's the cleanest way. You avoid any confusion about these things. You don't have one divided by zero denoting anything at all. So you just never run into one divided by zero. And so this makes the mathematics coherent. But as a side effect, it also makes computation safe. So all of these kinds of errors you run into with programs, 
you avoid through through the use of subtyping. You don't have array out of bounds. You don't have division by zero. You don't have uncaught exceptions. You don't have uh, uh, data type operations that are inapplicable. You don't you don't, for example, uh, take the uh, sub subtree uh, of of an empty tree, uh, for instance. So so many many issues like this are avoided. Uh, through through the use of uh, subtyping. Now it's it's easy to say that you know you add this feature to the language, but the critical thing is that uh, you end up with lots of proof obligations, and so it would be somewhat uh, uh, impractical if if you did not have the automation to go with it. And it turns out that by and large, most of these proof obligations can be discharged automatically, and so it it actually is something that. If if you can support with the automation is a useful feature to have. And then you can also define more complex proof strategies for discharging certain classes of uh, proof obligations. So that also helps to be able to define new proof strategies. Any questions at this point? I'll show you some examples of subtyping. No, no questions so far. Uh... Okay. So first, the, the uh, language is, is very uh, compact. So there's, uh, you know, in, in one slide, you're, you're getting uh, nearly 80% of the language. So a PVS specification is a collection of uh, libraries. Each library is going to be a collection of files. You can think of a library as a directory. Uh, it's a collection of files, uh, .pvs files. Each file is can, can contain a sequence of theories. Each theory is a sequence of uh, declarations. A declaration can introduce a variable. It can introduce a constant. It can introduce a type or it can introduce a, a formula that is a conjecture that you're trying to establish as a theorem. So the, the types include uh, the base types, booleans and numbers, the predicate subtypes that I just mentioned. You can also have dependent function, tuple and record types. And finally, you can have algebraic and co-algebraic data types such as lists, strings, trees, ordinals, and so on. The expression language is also quite simple. It's uh, you have the basic constants for booleans, true, false, and numbers zero, one, two, three, etc., minus one. Um, you have uh, function application, lambda abstraction. You have uh, construction and destruction of tuples. So a one to a n is constructed as an n tuple, and you can take the third element of it by saying a apostrophe three. Uh, so the uh, Records also are similar. They can be constructed as uh, field labels together with field values, and you can uh, take apart a record. Uh, you have conditional expressions. You have something called a case expression as well, uh, which is similar to a conditional. And you have updates. The, the updates are a very uh, helpful construct in, in PBS. So you can update functions. You can update uh, tuples. You can update records. You can update abstract data types. Um, so, so there's a lot you can do with updates. Well, so here's a uh, there's a question in the audience. Um, how do you uh, does your does PBS deal with failure in computation due to rounding? Uh, so, so for instance, if you have a uh, an algorithm, I guess uh, you need proof its correctness. Can can you prove that it's correct even with uh, rounding in hardware? Sure. Yeah. So that's correct. Yeah. So the the uh, Formalization in PVS is, is of the you know, exact infinite precision reals, but you are, there's also uh, libraries of floating point arithmetic. And uh, there are tools that have been used to actually prove uh, bounds on rounding errors, for instance, for some of these algorithms. So there's a tool called Precisa that can tell you what the floating point error is relative to the exact computation. Right, thank you, thank you Shankar. Okay, so the um, again the the language is uh, deceptively simple. It's the things get complicated when you have combinations of these features, but uh, it, it really helps to have a simple language when you're programming it. Or the, this is something I really appreciate because it's easy to add new functions. It usually takes half a day to a day to add functions because there's so few um, cases that you have to cover. Okay, so here's an example of a PVS theory that captures some of the features that I've already uh, mentioned. So here's a theory of functions. It goes from a domain to a range. 
So these two are the parameters to the theory and they're type parameters. And you give, have these uh, variable declarations for functions f and g, uh, for variables over the domain and for variables over the range. And then you can have, for example, extensionality as a postulate in this theory, uh, an axiom. And uh, so you can say that if for all x, uh, f of x is equal to g of x, uh, if and only if f is equal to g, you can have uh, this extensionality uh, thing, the implication as a lemma, and uh, you can have the other half of it as a congruence uh, postulate that if f is equal to g and x1 is equal to x2, then f of x1 is equal to f of x2. You can have the eta rule that if you have a lambda abstraction over f, then uh, you know it's equal to f itself. You can talk about the predicates such as injectivity, subjectivity, and bijectivity. And you can turn these predicates into types. So you can have a type of the bijective maps from D to R, for instance. Here's another kind of higher order uh, theory. So this one is about summation. So you can write this as a functional program. So you write a, a recursive functional program H sum, which is curried to take a function argument F, and then it is applied to a natural number N. And uh, it returns zero if the natural number is zero. Otherwise, it returns f of n minus one plus the h sum of type n minus one. So it's basically f of zero to f of plus uh, all the way to f of n minus one. It's a summation of those uh, numbers. And so you can talk about the identity function and the summation over the identity is equal to n times n plus one by two. Uh, sum of squares, sum of cubes, and uh, sum of fourth powers, and so on. So that's a simple example of uh, a, a program that you can write. So you can actually write and do programs uh, that in this kind of higher order logic and um, you, you can execute them as well. So a little bit about the proof obligation generation. So the type rules are shown here. So you can out of, out of any type and any uh, predicate over that type, you can actually have uh, uh, the subtype being given as a type. And then, you know, if you want to check that A has that subtype, then we can show that uh, it, it satisfies this predicate B when you substitute A for X under the, under the context gamma. So the context gamma is important out here. And one of the things you can do then is that you can enrich that context. So if you're uh, within an if then else, I'm writing this as a if then else in this form, if A then B L C then you can assume A when you're type checking B and you can assume not A when you're type checking C. So in the context, so that context helps you discharge the uh, proof obligation that's shown here in red. Now with this, uh, type checking is actually undecidable, even uh, a type, uh, whether a type is empty or not, and you can have empty types because you can use the everywhere false predicate. So even whether a type is empty or not is undecidable, whether checking whether two types are equivalent is undecidable. But there's something actually very uh, clean about the way the PVS type checker works. It does all the simple type checking. The, all the undecidability is pushed into the corner of the proof obligations. So that is now the, typically the user's burden to uh, discharge. So there's no undecidability in the type checker itself. There's only undecidability in the proof obligations generated by the type checker. And one important point here is that these subtypes are semantically subsets. One bottleneck in formalization is that uh, if you, for example, have a different type for natural numbers as from integers, as from rationals, as from real numbers, as from complex numbers, and so on. On the other hand, if these can be made subsets of each other, you gain a lot of convenience because you only have one zero for instance, okay, and, and zero belongs to all of those types um, and, and so on. So things like one and so on. So you, you uh, uh, gain a lot of efficiency by making sure that these are actually subsets. And this applies not just to numbers, it applies to lots of other uh, data types as well. So uh, out here, for instance, you can uh, give a precise signature for division, where you can say that the denominator for division is non-zero. And that, that way you're never going to apply it to a situation where the denominator is zero. So if you look at this situation, for instance, if X is not equal to Y, 
then uh, x plus y divided by x minus y is not equal to zero. Uh, this is uh, incorrect, by the way. It's uh, you know, just a conjecture. It's, uh, don't think of it as something that's proved. But the key thing here is that this denominator here is, is possibly zero, but it's only in the context that x is not equal to y that it's uh, not equal to zero. And so you can actually discharge the proof obligation that arises from this. And the proof obligation in this case looks as follows, that if x is not equal to y, then x minus y is not equal to zero. And this is, uh, again, the automation proves this quite easily. So I told you the you know one of the things that we optimize for is finding bugs quickly and efficiently, and uh, this happens to me all the time. You know, I there there are periods where I'm finding ten thousand dollars worth of bugs every five minutes. That is, if if I let these things uh, lurk in my formalization, I'll pay a hefty price for it later on. I might have even done a whole bunch of proofs uh, to find out. Uh, weeks later that uh, there's something you know, just fatally wrong with my uh, formalization. And one advantage here is with subtyping is that you catch these errors uh, at type check time. So you don't even have to start doing a proof. You can just look at the proof obligation and say, that doesn't make any sense. So this situation occurred to me when I uh, typed in this definition of uh, n choose k. So here, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, with factorial of n, already you can specify that it's a positive integer. So that you can actually get a good range type for the factorial operation because it returns one and it returns a product of something that's a positive integer with a positive integer or otherwise. So you you uh, end up with, uh, the, you, you can already see the subtyping mechanism uh, de giving you a lot of power here. But here you type this thing in innocently and uh, the type checker immediately comes back and says, I'll accept that what you have on the right is indeed a rational number, but why is it an integer, leave alone a positive natural number? And you can look at textbook after textbook after textbook in mathematics, and this mistake occurs in every one of these textbooks. Okay. And, and I mean, if this is the kind of mistake that you find, there's probably you know, a, a, a mistake in, you know, every two facing pages, there's at least one mistake in, in mathematics. So even reading, you know, books that have been widely read, gone through multiple editions, you find mistakes are still there. And so this this is the kind of thing that it's really great to have caught uh, as soon as you type it in. So, and it's a, a fair bit of work to actually prove that uh, it is indeed an integer. So you can, as I said, weaponize the uh, subtyping and you can use it to uh, actually show that certain closure conditions hold. So that for example, the sum of two non-negative reals is non-negative. The product is non-negative. The, the product of two positive reals is uh, positive. Uh, the composition of continuous functions is continuous. So all of these are properties that you can just uh, delegate to the, to the type checker and it actually builds up these uh, typing judgments. So it, this means that in addition to whatever type you're given something, you can always give it a better type. So plus might already have the type that takes two numbers and gives you a number, but you can say that it also takes two no even numbers and gives you an even number. These predicate subtypes are dependent. So this is actually not the same as dependent type theory. Um, this kind of subtyping is not there in dependent type theory, but it means that you, you have uh, uh, predicate dependencies in this. And so here's an example of a finite sequence given to you as a, as a dependent record, where the first field is the length, and it's a natural number. And the second field is a sequence, which is a function whose domain is below length. And so the, this is something which you can you know make sure that the sequence only has elements in it uh, indexed uh, from zero to length minus one. So this is, is a really useful uh, re restriction to have because these dependencies arise everywhere. You're always having the type of one component depend on the value of another. 
and uh, that's the kind of thing you can actually uh, put into uh, the the type system as well. You can have dependent records, dependent tuples, dependent uh, functions, and so on. So you can, uh, for example, here you you have the F ninety one function. If that example is not familiar to you, it's kind of a famous example in the functional programming literature, and uh, even though it has this complicated nested uh, recursion, the subtyping actually helps you not only uh, kind of prove that uh, it's type correct, it, it also helps you prove that it terminates. So, so you're simultaneously introducing this definition and showing that this function is really only equal to the G91 function, which returns I minus 10 when I is greater than 100 and 91 other ones. So this is... Uh, a kind of way of exploiting the subtyping and the, there's lots and lots of examples this is a feature that if you, you don't have enough formalism i'm definitely not interested in using it so then you can uh, go from something that's uh, computational to something that's uh, more uh, mathematical so here you, you have uh, the tasky cluster theorem so you have some parameters you can actually set up assumings on those parameters. So you can have assumptions like the ordering relation should be reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. And this uh, operation on, on sets of T should give you uh, the greatest lower bound. So it's, it not only really returns a lower bound, but it returns a greatest such lower bound. And you can use this, for example, to prove the Tosky master theorem that uh, a, a monotone uh, op operator on this uh, lattice yeah, it gives you a fixed point and you can also prove that it gives you a least fixed point and you can also define a greatest fixed point and many other things and you can actually do this by uh, dualizing so you can use the theory interpretation mechanism to actually dualize these arguments as well so this is theory interpretation so here you have a notion of a group homomorphism so you can also take in addition to uh, individuals and types, you can take theories as parameters. This means that uh, you expect a concrete U, G1 and G2, and a homomorphism between these. And you can show that, for example, there's a homomorphism between these two, that, uh, you know, the, the group of uh, the additive group over the integers and the multiplicative group over the non zero reals. So you can show that there's a group homomorphism there. I uh, mentioned that uh, you can take this down to uh, executable C code. So uh, for this, you uh, use uh, uh, an executable fragment of the specification language. One surprising thing, at least to me, the surprising is that uh, almost all of the language is executable. It's only equality over higher types uh, that's not executable. And that covers quantification as well over un unbounded quantification. That's the only thing that isn't executable. Just that one feature is not executable. Everything else is executable. And uh, so uh, there's also actually a really neat correspondence between a PBS theory and a C dot H and dot C uh, file uh, combination. So the, um, uh, uh, for each PBS theory, you end up with a dot H and a dot uh, C file. Actually, this is slightly misleading. It, uh, we tend to use a discipline of putting one theory in one file, but it's not, and it's not necessary to have you know multiple theories in a file. The file name can uh, be different from the theory name. So, but if if you have a theory foo, then you can generate foo dot h and foo dot c. The way this is done is by uh, first generating an intermediate uh, representation in something called a normal form, and that a normal form um, allows you to identify something called release points for the references. So the C code is standalone C code that not only takes care of uh, memory management, but it also is uh, efficient because it uh, tries to do the uh, update operations destructively to the extent that it's safe. So it only copies when needed and uh, does the update. So it preserves the mathematical uh, applicative semantics of the source PBS. So this... Uh, can be you know given an operational semantics that uh, you can show corresponds to the value of the, the PBS. 
that this is actually quite a huge, huge amount of effort. It's taken me years to build uh, PVSTC because there's a large semantic gap between these two, and, and there's lots of features of PVS that I haven't mentioned that uh, make it complicated to do this. But in the end, you get uh, standalone, executable, efficient code. And, and the full uh, thing uh, essentially implements uh, multi-precision, rational numbers, integers, floating point arithmetic. It um, uh, takes advantage of fixed, point, fixed size representations with safe cast. Since you proved all these theorems in PBS, it's fine for you to take two big nums, two multi-precision rational numbers, subtract them and claim that it's a uh, uint eight, simply because the, the context in which it occurred, you'd already proved the theorem that it actually fit with an uint eight. And so it's safe to do these castings. You have uh, those finite sequences give you uh, dependent dynamically sized arrays. So you can actually have those. You can have dependent records and tuples, higher order functions, closures. You have updatable closures. So you have uh, a concept of infinite arrays that you can uh, use as well. Uh, you have uh, characters and strings, algebraic data types like lists and trees, parametric theories. Actually doing this is somewhat challenging because you want to do this with uh, uh, unboxed polymorphism so that uh, you, you get something that's efficient. And so this is uh, quite a challenging thing to uh, implement. And uh, memory map, file IO, you can uh, add semantic attachments for foreign operations that you only have axiomatized in PBS. And you can get a persistent uh, JSON representation of the, of the data. The key thing is that it's uh, a, a well-typed PBS program can't go wrong other than by running out of resources. That's the, the, the type system gives you that kind of safety guarantee. Okay, so that brings me to my conclusion. So uh, I started off by motivating what we do as abstraction engineering. Abstraction engineering uh, depends heavily on being able to do formalization of the abstractions and being able to manipulate things at the abstract level. Uh, you know, there, there's a kind of rich uh, set of concepts uh, one deals with in both computer science and mathematics, a, a rich uh, a collection of abstractions and uh, relations between these abstractions that one manipulates. And uh, so the, uh, the formalism helps one with that. PVS is a formal framework for doing this kind of uh, abstraction engineering. It allows the mathematics to be uh, represented uh, coherently and uh, precisely. The uh, interactive proof assistant is used for constructing proofs. It's uh, also useful for extracting safe and efficient code. Uh, the idea of a prototype like this is that uh, we are still in the early stages of formalization. There's a lot we don't yet know about how best to formalize mathematical concepts, uh, how to uh, formalize uh, uh, large scale computational models. So this is something we, we kind of have been learning a lot about and PVS is continuously uh, undergoing uh, enhancements and improvements from feedback that we get. I can do a, a demo at this point of this time, or I can answer questions. Yeah, um, first, uh, yeah, thank you, Shankar. Uh, let's, let's thank Shankar for the, for the interesting talk, and um, yeah, I, I think I think uh, let me see. We have about six minutes left. Uh, maybe I will just check real quick to to see if people have questions, and then and then if there's time, let's we, we can look at a take a look at a demo. Uh, anyone has questions? Urgent questions? Uh, feel free to raise your hand in the Zoom chat or. Uh, or, or I can see that Yanis uh, has a question. So, oh yes, Yanis, uh, yeah, you have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, the question I have is related to let's say uh, Gödel's theorems. Now, do you think if you arrive in the case that you are gonna let's say prove one, uh, let's say uh, um, you know. Um, one theorem, and then and then and then you prove the the inconsistent one. Like, will your program detect that? That actually, it, it like, will it be able to to, to work through Gödel's, you know, 
this is a, a, a great question. So the the uh, one of the uh, you know when you write formalizations, you're often introducing axioms, and your axioms might be inconsistent. So uh, this concept of theory interpretations that uh, I spoke about was introduced precisely for that purpose, is to show that uh, it's at least relatively consistent. That is, it, the, this particular axiomatization has a model and something that mathematicians accept uh, as, as being consistent. Of course, there's no absolute consistency proof here, but you, you can use theory interpretations to do relative consistency proofs, and you find lots of interesting mistakes that way. Sometimes uh, there, there's a proof uh, of uh, clock synchronization that a colleague of mine did. And uh, in, in, in his axiomatization, it was consistent, but uh, it, it only allowed exactly synchronized clocks. Uh, you know, somehow or the other, it, uh, it didn't, it, it accidentally didn't allow the very thing that it was trying to model. So, so you know, being able to do the theory interpretations for consistency actually is another effective way to reveal errors. And it's very easy to win. Great, great mathematicians have gotten their axioms wrong. So it's not surprising that the rest of us can do this quite easily. Thank you, uh, Yanis and Shankar. So actually, I'm I'm personally very interested in seeing a demo. I That's actually tied, tied with my question. Uh, how, how do proofs work in PBS? Do you have, you have an example of how how uh, the assistant will go about uh, proving the theorem with a human? Yeah, let me uh, show you an example. Um, so uh, can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen, uh, the VS code. Okay. So uh, in this, I'm, I'm uh, formalizing big number arithmetic. And uh, so here, uh, this theory big num takes a parameter that's the base, and I want it to be above one. That is, I want it to be at least two. So it's two, three, four, five, six uh, should be the base. And uh, what I'm going to formalize is basically what a numeral is, what the value of a numeral is, what it means to add two numbers. So here I'm giving myself um, a variable LMN that uh, variables LMN that range over that but I'm capturing the carry in as a, a variable that's of type up to one. That is, it can be either zero or one. So that's a nice kind of subtype that constrains a carry in to be just zero or one. And a digit is something that's now below the base. That is, uh, if the base is 10, then the digit is between zero and nine, for example. So that's what below base means. So that's it's defined that way. And remember base is at least two. Okay, then uh, a, a typing judgment here tells you that one is definitely a digit, regardless of the base. But, uh, because if the base is at least two, then one is definitely a digit. Um, so uh, a big num here is given as a list of digits. So a list, uh, don't worry about what uh, a list is at this point. Uh, so a numeral is basically of type big num. That is, it's a list of digits in little Indian order. That is the head of the list will be the least significant digit. So when I want to compute the value of X, I can do this by a case analysis on X. If X is empty, I return zero. If X is non-empty, then I take the least significant digit I and add it to the base times the recursive value of Y. So the, the tail of the list returns a value. So if my number is, for example, uh, two, three, four, 234, uh, then the list will be four, three, two. So it'll be four plus 10 times three plus 100 times two. So that's what you'll end up with with this. And it terminates because the length of X is uh, getting smaller with each recursive call. Um, so that does generate termination proof obligations. Then this here is a digit addition. I can add one digit to a numeral. And the way I do it is if the num numeral is empty, then I create a singleton digit with i, with the exception that if i is equal to zero, I just return the empty list. Because I, you know, there, there are two ways of representing zero, either as singleton zero, actually you can have many ways of representing zero, because uh, zero is an acceptable digit. But you want to normalize it to something that is, uh, for example, the empty list. And if uh, x has uh, got a least significant digit j, then you 
uh, add i to j, you add the two digits and compare it to the base. If it's less than the base, then you make that the leading uh, digit and uh, you keep y. If it's uh, greater than the base, then you subtract the base and then you digit, you do the digit addition with y instead. So that's like a carry out of one. And so now you can you can actually prove this is uh, uh, got the right thing. That is, if you digit add i to x, then the value of x is the value of uh, plus the uh, value of x plus i is equal to the value of x plus the value of i. So you can start a proof, and uh, this proof is basically something called induct and simplify and close it. So the inductance simplifies the strategy. It invokes a number of uh, smaller steps in order to finish this proof. Then here I've actually defined big plus in the same way, similar to the value, uh, the digit addition. And uh, so X and Y uh, are added together with a carry in. And in particular, if X is empty, then it's just Y plus the carry in. It's a digit addition. So the uh, plus operator there is actually overloaded. So in addition to this kind of plus, that uh, plus is over in order to do digit addition as well. If uh, X has a least significant digit J, then I uh, essentially decompose Y. If Y is empty, then it's uh, the digit addition of C in with uh, X. Otherwise, if uh, Y has a least significant digit K, then I add uh, J, K and the carry in, and I compare it to the base. And if it's greater than or equal to the base, then I ought to be subtracting the base. But here I've made a mistake. I've swapped the then and else cases just to be uh, perverse about it. And um, so I, I retain the this thing when it's greater than or equal to the base. And I recursively add x1 and y1 and make that the rest of the numeral. In the remaining case, when it's actually less than the base, I subtract the base mistakenly. And uh, again, I do the uh, addition there, but I do it with a carry in of uh, one. So here I don't have a carry in, here I have a carry in of one. So then I go to prove that the value of big plus of x, y, and c n is uh, equal to the value of x plus the value of y plus the c n itself. So you go do this. And uh, so that uh, digit addition actually lemma turns out to be useful. So you rewrite with that and it finishes the proof. So those are your tactics. So that, those are the proof strategies. That, no, that, that shows that something went horribly wrong. I hmm. proved an incorrect algorithm correct. I see. So, you know, something where I should have subtracted, I, I should have swapped this expression with this expression. But, you know, this, this was uh, something that, um, you know, I, I should not have, been able to prove. So what actually happens is that there's nothing wrong with this proof. The value is actually conserved because when you do do this, you get something that's larger than the base. But because of the carry in being zero out here, the value is actually conserved. And when you do this, you subtract the base, but you take carry in of one so that you know the base uh, thing there is actually conserved as well. So uh, it's, it's a thing where you end up you know, this is in fact true for the strong definition. But what fails are these, these proof obligations here. So where you have to show that when Cn plus J plus K is greater than or equal to the base, then it's actually less than the base that you're not going to be able to prove. That's why you're, you're not able to prove it. Okay, so, so you get caught doing this. So that, that's kind of surprising that even with a bad definition, you were able to prove the key property, but the proof, it was the, type correctness condition that actually trapped you. That's very nice. That's very nice that that you was able to catch that. Yeah. So and, and uh, you can go back and you can uh, yeah, you can uh, fix this if you want and you can say uh, I'm going to Then you can uh, you run the proof. check this. And you can uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and actually, read on everything. You can say meta x pr t.
So uh, Shankar, in, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to stop the live stream on YouTube, but mm -hmm. we could we can continue discussions um, in the Zoom chat. Is, is that okay? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, we're going to end the live stream now. Uh, let us thank Actually, something yeah. went wrong with this demo. Oh. So the proof didn't actually complete. So I need to go back and look at that. So, but we can continue, yeah. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, yeah, let's thank Shankar again. And before we live end the live stream, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Yeah, I'm going to end the live stream now and we'll, we'll stay on in the Zoom chat. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, get to know you uh, folks. I, 